Hey everyone, we have another news recap for you from the last couple of days of hardware news from Computex 2021. In this one, we'll be talking about Best Buy warning of 3080 Ti availability. That's a surprise. We'll also be going over some cool stuff though from Intel, where Intel is looking at the XE HPG DG2 GPUs. So the GPU components coming out in the future. Something that we, we really wish Intel would have included in its keynote but we do have a little bit to talk about there anyway. G-Skill is working with MSI to launch a new case series and is also working on memory for inclusion with that, effectively making pre-built kits sans a GPU. And Montech has air coolers. We'll also be going over some NVIDIA DLSS and RTX changes and some other stories from the past couple days in hardware news. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's new keyboard. EVGA's new Z20 and Z15 RGB optical mechanical gaming keyboards have abundant RGB LEDs and programmable macro keys on the left side of the keyboard. They also have a sensor to detect and turn on the LEDs when you're in front of the keyboard and turn them off when distant, offering a unique feature for keywords. The keyboard claims a 0.5 millisecond response time and 100 million keystroke lifespan. Learn more at the link in the description below. So first of all, we have a couple of other news videos from the last few days as well. It's been a busy week in computer hardware. We talked about the keynotes from Intel and from AMD. We did the 3080 Ti review. And then we also have a mini Computex news roundup like this one that we have on the channel or will have on the channel depending on the publishing timelines. So check those out if you haven't already. The AMD keynote coverage, as we noted in the previous video, has some cool stuff about 3D vCache which is a new approach to AMD's Zen CPUs, where AMD is soldering cache onto the CCX. Really cool, check out the video for more on that. I'm trying to point people that way because it's, it's uh, a positive sort of light in a bunch of critical stories lately, so we were happy to get that one. All right, Best Buy is the first one, speaking of critical stories. So Best Buy is bracing for impact with the launch of the RTX 3080 Ti. At the time this video goes up, the 30 Ti will have been made available through retail stores. The card launched on June 3rd, and the day prior to launch, Best Buy posted a warning about availability of the Founders Edition cart. The company noted that it will only be selling the RTX 3080 Ti Founders Edition in physical locations, and that it will not support online sales for this one. Further, Best Buy seems to imply that it's the only retailer or carrier of the RTX 3080 Ti Founders Edition specifically to begin with. Best Buy provided a list of stores and said that it will hand tickets out for the cards at 7.30 a.m. local time for each store and that the ticket count would equal the available video card count. Now, this is just for the launch, clearly, but the tickets will be able to be redeemed at 9 a.m. local time at those stores. Best, the real takeaway here is just that Best Buy appears to be bracing for impact on low availability and probably customer complaints. But as for the FE card that we and a lot of other people reviewed, that's only going to be at Best Buy from what this corporate press release seems to indicate. So that gets you up to speed on the, the thing that you shouldn't buy. Unless you're going to go buy it and then sell it to someone else who is in the line for a profit. In which case, we will, we will judge you, but we won't say you shouldn't buy it because at least then you have a purpose. It's doing something other than just you getting ripped off for uh, the 3080 Ti for gaming or whatever. You can literally see it. All right, Intel XE HPG DD2 news. This was shown by Raja Kadori. If you don't know that name, Raja Kadori previously worked at AMD and Apple and AMD might have been at Tesla or something at one point. He's got a storied history in computer hardware, has done a lot in the industry. Uh, most recently known on stage for Vega and RDNA discussion. But Kadori now works at Intel, has for quite a while, and released a teaser photo of the XE GPU. Again, this is for the DG2 die. It's the uh, die on substrate alone. There's no PCB associated with it, just the substrate and the die. And this was via Twitter following Intel's train wreck of a keynote. Again, really wish that they would have included something like this from Raja's team in there. Kadori and uh, Tom Peterson, a couple other people at the company, have a lot of public speaking experience and enough or a lot, depending on who it is, technical expertise to really deliver on a keynote. But whatever, Intel does it a different way than their competitors for some reason. Back to you, Steve. So we did get to at least see the silicon in some capacity. Kadori tweeted the following, uh, quote, XEHPG DG2 real candy. A very productive time at the Folsom Lab a couple of weeks ago. Lots of game and driver optimization work ahead for Lisa Pierce's team. They're all very excited and a little scared, he said. Thanks, Steve. And we don't blame them. 
Even the biggest companies have trouble releasing GPUs to praise. But also drivers are notoriously hard to do, and certainly Mr. Kadori, out of all people, would know about that from his time at AMD when AMD had really some of the messiest drivers. They had to clean it up. Gotten better these days, but a couple years ago it was not the case. So the team at Intel is definitely well aware of the limitations and challenges ahead of them with drivers. So that's all for now on the DG2 stuff. We had some news previously, rumors about 512 EU count DG2 GPUs, which would put them at 4096 shader units. And uh, we don't really have any firm details beyond that, just sort of rumblings in the industry. But uh, you know, we're looking forward to another GPU provider and testing it out once it's ready. While we're talking about Raja Kadori's Twitter account, we'll also note that he had a tweet picked up in uh, forums online where Kadori stated in a tweet that Intel is looking at the possibility of getting involved with AMD's FSR, or Fidelity FX Super Resolution, for Intel's future GPUs. Kadori stated, quote, the DL, or deep learning, capabilities of XEHPG architecture do lend to approaches that achieve better quality and performance. We will definitely try to align with open approaches to make ISV's jobs easier. And to clarify here, ISV means independent software vendor. So that'd be like the game companies, for example. G-Skill and MSI up next, launching a case for Airflow with some special skinned RAM for it as well. So MSI has launched the MPG Gaming Maverick Bundle Kit. And no, it is not from the Paul Brothers. It's, it's actually... That's their new brand. This is a fancy branding for a PC without a GPU in it. So it's sort of a kit GP, a kit PC, similar to the Intel NUC. The advantage that the Intel NUC and others like it have, though, is that they're unique form factors, often unique motherboards, uh, enclosures, things that you can't get anywhere else, like the motherboards especially, where especially when they start soldering stuff to it. That's a little bit different like the Hades Canyon stuff in the past. But with this, it's just a computer. It's a desktop that doesn't have a video card because it at least shows they're having as much trouble getting them as anyone else. Uh, and then they sell you that, and then you can put the card in it if you're able to get one. The bundle includes a case, a motherboard, a closed-loop liquid cooler, an 11700K, and two sticks of 16 gigabyte G-Skill memory. And all of these have the same design motif. Given the number of pre-builds that are being stripped for their GPUs and flipped on eBay, selling a brand new pre-built without any GPU at all is probably going to be a tough sell for G-Skill and MSI. The most interesting aspects are the case and the RAM. The MPG Velox 100P Airflow SP doesn't appear to be available outside of the bundle yet, but it actually has holes in it, so it's a lot more promising than previous MSI cases we've looked at. It's also part of uh, the bundle that includes four 120mm stock fans, and that's not counting the fans on the CLC. We'll be interested to see if this solves some of the airflow problems that the Sakira 500X had. That's a case that suffered more from poor design than poor quality. The trailer for the bundle also reveals that the Velox 100P includes a revolutionary power on. You've probably not heard of these before, so we'll explain the technical details in as simple terminology as possible so that we don't lose anyone in the audience. Uh, so a power on button, it's sort of like, you can think of it like a switch. It goes on the case and uh, it's pretty tactical, but what you do is you push it w using one of your digits as a human. You, you can use that to push the power on button. Uh, we're not really sure what happens after that, but that's how it works. And uh, we look forward to trying it out once it comes in so we can understand more about the technical details and the architecture behind this power on button so that we can detail fully how it operates. We understand it has something to do with electricity and signals, but beyond that, it's just magic, basically. Of course, we always like to ask our audience for opinions and input on new technologies like this because a lot of you work in fields where you may have encountered things that we haven't. So if you have encountered a power on button at some point in your career, please let us know in the comments what you think it does and how they work, because we're, we're just really behind here. So the memory included is a 32 gigabyte kit. It's two by 16 gigabytes, DDR4-3600, and the kit is called Trident Z Maverick. It's mainly interesting because MSI has roped the G-Skill into creating a product for this cross promotion, but other than the heat spreader design, this seems like a typical kit. Primary timings are 18, 22, 22, 
42, which aren't exceptional at this frequency. Up next, Montec has a new air cooler called the Air Cooler 210. Montec's a relatively new company to cases and coolers. They have previously had the X1, X2, and now coming up another case in a mesh series, and we'll be looking at those soon too. But Montec just this week announced a new air cooler. It's a single fan tower cooler. Its MSRP is supposed to be $50. We saw it from 50 to 60 on Newegg, and it is competing in sort of the Scythe Fuma 2 category of cooler, Scythe Fuma 2 being about $60 as well, and which we reviewed recently, very positively, we'll, we'll add. So this looks like it's trying to slot into the something better than a Hyper 212 bracket. The 210 in the name comes from the 210 watt TDP number that Montec has assigned to it. As a reminder, TDP is sort of a, it's a flexible number. What it means depends on the manufacturer. A lot of times this will be de defined not by the CPU definition of TDP, but instead by a dummy heater definition, makes a little more sense where they're putting 210 watts into the dummy heater uh, in order to maintain some acceptable temperature, whatever they've determined that is in their testing lab. Other times it can be associated with AMD or Intel TDPs, which also mean different things. AMD is especially, which doesn't have power anywhere in the formula for TDP. Point is that number doesn't mean anything. So if we test it, that would be where you get the, the information on if it's any good. So uh, competitors directly, it would be the FUMA 2, and if you want other reference points, the Noctua NHD 15 or the Assassin 3 at the $80 to $90 mark would be sort of the higher end of air coolers. Also in the news, the NVIDIA DLSS and RTX updates outside of the hardware updates from the 3080 Ti. The GeForce RTX 3080 Ti. So NVIDIA's headline on its blog says that NVIDIA RTX and DLSS title support jumps to over 130. That number includes things that aren't just games, and it muddies the, the total count quite a bit. But we're going to go through some of the changes anyway. So this is games and applications that include ray tracing, NVIDIA DLSS, quote, or AI features. And if we look at just the Wikipedia list of games with ray tracing support, that shows uh, just over 30 PC games that are currently using NVIDIA RT. And that includes games with barely noticeable implementations like Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So yes, some games are finally adding RT support, and yes, RT-capable consoles will push adoption further, but inflating that number comes across as defensive. Adding 100 to the total count uh, and making it look like it's all about games, is, it's misleading at best. That's not to downplay the advancements they've made, but we're just trying to keep it in perspective here, closer to reality, so that everybody has a, a realistic expectation of what's going on. Because when you say including AI and other things like architectural viz, it's a little different meaning than what people playing video games are expecting. So there are eight newly RTXified titles that are core to this announcement. And those include Doom Eternal, Red Dead Redemption 2, Rainbow Six Siege, Icarus, Lego Builder's Journey, Dying 1983, The Ascent, and The Persistence. We actually hadn't heard of Quite a few of these titles, for example, The Persistence has an all-time peak concurrent player count of 29, and LEGO Builders is a small-scale puzzle game that sounds like the same sort of half-jokey candidate for RTX that Minecraft was, but it actually got implementation. The former three titles are more promising. Doom Eternal is very well received, and its new Vulcan ray tracing lighting fits well with the existing game. The fast-paced gameplay should benefit from higher frame rates enabled by DLSS, so this also makes a lot of sense, and that update is planned to ship later this month. Also, uh, beneficial for Doom and for RTX is that the Doom series for the last, couple gen uh, last two games launched now has been extremely well built, runs at a high frame rate while still looking pretty good, and a lot of that's down to programming and engine level changes that have been made by the developers. So because it runs so well, enabling RT doesn't comparatively take away as much performance or put you into an absolute low FPS that you might see in another game. Red Dead Redemption 2 just gets DLSS and no lighting effects, but there's no mention in NVIDIA's announcement of whether this will apply to both the DX12 and the Vulcan variations. At least though, this is a fairly demanding game and should benefit from DLSS. Speaking of which, Rainbow Six Siege is also just getting uh, DLSS here. Keep in mind that DLSS requires an RTX card and the lowest tier of RTX card currently in existence is the RTX 2060, which in our benchmarking ran Siege at 240 FPS average at 1080p Ultra, or 76 FPS average at 4K. Finally, Nvidia is proud to announce its own Fortnite map with the big GPU in it, hot on the heels of AMD doing exactly the same thing a year ago, except AMD was revealing a product and Nvidia is its 
celebrating the existence of the GeForce RTX 3080 tie. Uh, but you can check Nvidia's press release for the creative map code and marvel at the sight of a GPU in a video game. Because where else are you going to find a 3080 Ti? Up next, EK. EK announced several new pre-builds, liquid coolers, and custom water solutions in the Quantum line. And uh, it's revamped some of its existing lines too. The main focus though is on what EK is calling EK Matrix 7 as a standard. The pre-builds are the X7000C and the X7000RM workstations and a mini series, which is a small form factor gaming PC. The C workstation is compact, although EK didn't offer specific measurements in the initial press release we got, instead saying that it is, quote, packaged into a form factor similar to a compact subwoofer and that it can fit up to four liquid-cooled GPUs. The RM model stands for Rack Mountable with a 5U chassis that features up to seven GPUs and is user-expandable, according to EK. And in terms of products that we are more likely to review, the new EK Nucleus AIO uh, Lux Edition and the EK Nucleus AIO Vision are the most promising candidates in terms of things that we regularly review. We recently reviewed EK's AIO Elite and found it to have strong performance comparatively. EK only mentioned cosmetic features when describing the new CLCs, so it's reasonable to think that performance will remain similar if the construction is similar to the previous solutions that we've reviewed from EK. The simpler ARGB Lux model is available on 120, 240, and 360 mil options with prices of $95, $125, and $160. The Vision CLCs have a customizable LCD on the pump housing, and they're available at $210 for the 240mm model and $240 for the 360mm model. Clearly at this point, you're not getting better performance proportionally with that expense. It's, it might even be worse, but you're paying for an LCD on the display or on the the pump lock. So this has been done in the past. Asus did this a year or two ago. Gigabyte's been playing around with this idea. NDXT sort of has done this as well, actually. So it's a direction that people are going, but uh, the extent to which it affects the, the, the cost is severe. And it's, again, it's diminishing returns on performance. You're just paying for the looks. If you're cool with that though, EK has something that it's working on. So in the future, EK plans to introduce a dark line with no LEDs at all. And also wants to introduce an even more expensive Elite series. EK summarized its Computex presence in four parts, with the final part being a catch-all roundup of updates to the Quantum line. The most practical is Matrix 7, which is EK's branding for its plan to lay out everything in units of seven millimeters. This change would increase compatibility between parts, once made by EK at least, and it would make cleaner builds possible. It's a pity that this never happened when having multiple GPUs in a system was something people regularly wanted, uh, but EK also plans to work with manufacturers to standardize radiator rail placement in Matrix 7 certified cases. This might not sound that exciting, but anyone who's tried to build an open loop in a tight space should know how helpful this could be. And that's it for the second part of our Computex closeout coverage. If there's any other major stories, we'll cover it probably in a normal hardware news roundup. Uh, but thank you for watching. As always, you can subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersaccess.net or patreon.com slash gamersaccess. Help us out directly. And check the channel for other news uploads from the past week. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.